In the previous video, we began our adaptation of the vending machine controller to accept pennies. We saw how to expand each of the main devices to 8 bits. The major step remaining is to build a coin encoder that will convert coin inputs into binary outputs that can be fed into the adder. There are two categories of encoders, no priority and yes priority. Let's look at the simpler no priority encoder first to understand our goal. We'll then develop the more useful priority encoder for use in our final machine. An abbreviated function table for the encoder is shown here. I call it abbreviated because there are four inputs, one for each coin type, which should yield 16 rows, but we only see five rows. The assumption here is that only one coin input will be active at one time. So we don't have row 1100 because quarter and dime cannot be active simultaneously. This is a big assumption. It is how the machine should work, but machines don't always work perfectly. It isn't hard to imagine a situation where the quarter signal is stuck high while a new dime is added. With all these don't care conditions, we aren't designing for that possibility. Regardless, this is the function table which helps us understand the purpose of the encoder. This middle column represents the money equivalent of the coins deposited. For example, a quarter is 25 cents and a dime 10 cents. The output columns represent the binary equivalent of those money totals. Decimal 25 equals binary 11001. Decimal 10 equals 01010. No coins yields all zeros. Why are there five output columns? because 25 is the highest number to count to, and that requires 5 bits. The equations become simple to develop from this table. Let's go one output column at a time. When is C4 high? Only when a quarter is input. Therefore, C4 equals Q. When is C3 high? There are two possibilities. Either a quarter or a dime is input. Therefore, C3 equals Q or D. Continue this pattern for all the columns. C2 equals N. C1 equals D. C0 is the most complicated because there are three possibilities. C0 equals P or N or Q. These simple equations lead to a simple logic circuit shown here. The four coin inputs lead to a 5-bit output. What happens if no coins are activated? Then the output is all zeros, which is exactly what we want. A slightly more robust design is a priority encoder. If two or more coin signals happen to be active at the same time, the larger coin gets counted and the smaller coins are ignored. Practically, this is nice for the vending machine user. If both a dime and quarter are active, they get credit for the quarter. The function table expresses this idea concisely. If Q is high, then we don't care what the other input signals are doing. The quarter will be counted, and the output is thus 11001. On the next row up, if quarter is low and dime is high, then the remaining signals do not matter. The dime will be counted, and the output is thus 01010. This pattern continues throughout the table. The penny signal only matters if all of the other coin signals are low. In that case, the output equals 00001. And of course, when no coin signals are active, the output should equal 0. The function table can be translated into K maps for each output column. But this is a little tricky because of all the don't care conditions. C4 equals 1 in just one row of the table, but that will actually translate into 8 squares of the map. This says that any time Q equals 1, then C4 must equal 1. So, in this bottom left square, Q equals 1. Therefore, C4 equals 1. In the next square over, Q still equals 1. Therefore, C4 equals 1. 
and this is true for the entire bottom half of the map. Now for the C3 map. This 1 in the bottom row matches what we just saw for C4. Anytime Q is high, then C3 is high, so 1's fill out the entire bottom half. This other 1 in the table tells us that C3 is high when Q equals 0 and D equals 1. That corresponds with this whole row of the map. Therefore, C3 is high in this square, this square, this square, and this square. It is nice how many big blocks of 1's fill out these maps. The equations will be simple. This group of 8 tells us that C4 equals Q. These two groups of 8 tell us that C3 equals Q or D. The next equations will only be slightly more complicated. C2 is high only when Q equals 0, D equals 0, and N equals 1. This zooms us in to only these two squares on the K map. You can see this is where Q equals 0, D equals 0, and N equals 1. C1 is high only when Q equals 0 and D equals 1. This takes us straight to the second row of the K-map, where we fill in all 1s. And finally we reach C0. The bottom one in the table corresponds with the entire bottom half of the K-map, every time Q is high. This middle one corresponds to Q equals 0, D equals 0, and N equals 1, which is these two squares just like what we saw for C2. And this last one only fills in one square, with input code 0001. With that, the K-map is complete. When grouping this map, don't forget about the wraparound groups of four. Those K-maps provide us this set of five equations. Those equations allow us to build this logic circuit. Even though the priority encoder function sounds complicated at first, it can be built with a relatively simple circuit. Now let's test out this encoder in the simulator. The main point of building a separate encoder device is that we can test it before trying to include it in the larger vending machine. We compartmentalize functions, so we can make sure they work individually before wrecking the whole system. Currently, no coins are being added, and the output is all zeros, as it should be. If I activate the penny, the output is 1, which makes sense. If I activate the nickel, the output is 5. So far, so good. Now when I put in a dime, the output is A. This looks strange at first, but recall this is a hex display. Hex A equals decimal 10, which matches the value of a dime. Finally, a quarter produces output 1, 9. Is this right? Yes. Recall that the second digit in hex has a weight of 16. So, 1, 9 in hex equals 16 plus 9, or 25 in decimal. Of course, if you feel uncomfortable in hex, you can always display the binary values and verify these align with the function table. All the coins work individually, but a priority encoder also needs to work when multiple inputs are active. Notice how, when I leave the quarter high, I can activate any of the other inputs, and the output is locked in at 25 cents. Now let's activate just the nickel. The output shows 5 cents. If I activate the penny, the nickel has priority, so the output is still 5 cents. But if I activate the dime, that trumps the nickel, and the output updates to 10 cents. Let's take this new device and combine it with the 8-bit adder, register, and comparator to complete our vending machine controller. It looks overwhelming at first, but by now we understand all the components. This is still an adder, which provides the next state logic. This is still a register, which stores the state memory. This is still a comparator, which determines the output logic. Our new encoder slots in before the adder. The coin inputs feed straight into the encoder. The 5-bit output feeds into the matching 5 bits of the adder. The idea of the one-shot to control the clock pulse has not changed. We have just increased the size of the OR gate to allow pennies to trigger it. 
The final change is that the price is now set by two hex keyboards rather than one. Read this as a two-digit hex number. Hex 28 is equivalent to decimal 32 plus 8, so the price is still 40 cents. Now for a test. I'll flip coin return to clear the register. Then I'll add one penny. The register changes to 1. Then I'll add one nickel. The register increases by 5 to 6. Then I'll add one dime. The register increases by 10 to 16. Wait, where do we see the 16? The register is 8 bits, so we are reading it through two hex displays. Hex 1, 0 equals decimal 16. Then I'll add 1 quarter. The total should now be 41 cents, or hex 2, 9. 41 cents is greater than the price of 40 cents. For the first time, Vend Available is activated. I can pick a soda, and the register drops down to 0 cents. What happened to the extra 1 cent I paid? It is gone. Remember that we don't have the ability to remember change in this design. But it wouldn't be very hard to include that. Just follow the same steps we did in this design. From the earlier video, we already know that the two needed devices are a subtractor and a multiplexer. Expand each of these devices to 8 bits and wire appropriately. It is satisfying how design patterns can be expanded to handle larger and larger values. Sure, there are more wires twisting around and there are more devices to filter through, but the same operations are being performed. I encourage you to keep this in mind as you continue your studies of digital design and computer architecture. There is no magic or randomness. In any circuit, there will be a set of underlying patterns, and you can figure them out.